Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Luis Pereira da Silva, Deputy General Manager at the Bank for International Settlements, and I'm honored to participate in this virtual forum organized by Euromoney and Global Capital Events. I have six personal messages that I will develop in order. My quick summary is, climate risks are large and material. There is urgency to act. Climate policies will have important distributional impact, require significant coordination, especially with the private sector, using multiple instruments and mobilizing adequate financing for the transition to net zero. So first, physical risks due to climate change are real, significant, and mounting. Each of us can see devastating weather events every day. Insurance companies, banks, regulators, and central banks know these huge costs very well. Beyond circumstantial evidence, scientists in the latest IPCC report are telling us exactly that in a comprehensive way. True, weather is not climate that various data sets are confirming worrisome trends. The increasing volume of losses and the large share of uninsured losses in the financial and real sectors. These climate-related losses could become, some already are, huge systemic losses that can derail entire economies, especially when they are associated with other phenomena. For example, massive migration that may occur with much faster speed than we anticipate. Given that the value of insurance is to share the risks across population, financial markets cannot effectively hedge against these climate-related risks because they will affect all of us. Such risks imply a very asymmetric gain to the financial industry, especially listening to what the best science is telling us today, that is, we are on the path of a 4 degrees Celsius average temperature increase. Therefore, there are entire regions of the world called red zones, where insurance is not available anymore. So second now, there is urgency to act. Urgency in addressing these risks arises because of their size and their asymmetric and irreversible nature. Scientists are telling us that global warming is not a process that will self-correct, and that we could hope that a technological white night might come before it is too late. The irreversible nature of some of the effects of climate change is also something that price discovery mechanisms alone have difficulties taking into account. So a wait-and-see attitude today is precisely a risky proposition in the light of what climate science has already established. It is also irresponsible and unfair to future generations. The prudent line is deploy mitigation policies now. So we are running out of time. According again to the IPCC, we have about a total budget of 450 gigatons of additional emissions of greenhouse gases before reaching a tipping point where the increase in the average temperature crosses the 1.5 degrees Celsius mark. Beyond that, global warming unleashes and our current pace of emissions that represents about 10 years. At the BIS, our contribution has been to alert about this new type of systemic risk. We call it a green swan. A green swan comes from what the best science tells us. It is not unlikely or not an unexpected event, a so-called tail risk. It is certain to happen, with devastating consequences for our societies if we deplete the rest of our carbon budget. It will trigger much more than just huge financial losses threatening global financial stability. An example, the COVID-19 pandemic is perhaps an illustration of what we thought about climate change. The conditions leading up to it were slow moving, but when the adverse global effects materialize, they happen quickly. Another reason to act urgently is the benefits of signaling an orderly transition. Uncertainty on the transition path could lead to severe financial instability, a kind of climate Minsky moment. The increase in transition risks is somehow in the making, not under some kind of nice portfolio rebalancing process. It could be unfortunately unfolding in a disorderly overshooting that is frequent in financial markets. 
For example, in the absence of specific regulatory guidance, many asset managers and pension funds may start anticipated and begin divesting from certain types of assets. Indeed, reputational pressure seems to be mounting. That can trigger potentially large financial swings. The role of public guidance would be to indicate direction and facilitate the creation of a path of gradual adjustment that is sustainable, reasonable, and agreed upon. For example, the type of Paris Agreement or any type of other coordinated approach. Some of these public guidance should take the form, for example, of a trajectory for the carbon tax. Another is to facilitate the emergence of reporting standards on emissions by corporates. Turning to financial regulation, it should reduce uncertainty on the path to uh, net zero and would contribute to hamper excessive volatility in the valuation of portfolios. It does not imply that financial regulation is the silver bullet, and even if it were, it would be used with wisdom and gradualism. But the GFC has shown that even small pockets of high credit risk can paralyze the global financial system. Likewise, the mandate of regulators and supervisors is to secure that sufficient capital is held against physical and transition risks. On the other side of the coin, greenwashing, greenwashing of assets is also a risk. But these risks are present at any turning point of technological change and innovation. Changes are generally associated with risks. That's not really surprising and not insurmountable. Rather, they are controllable. One thing must be clear, however, that supposed risks must not be used as an excuse to justify inaction. Better response is to engage into the regulatory approach that will set the path for sustainable innovation combined with the right public support in R&D and legislation that prevents a monopolistic capture of the innovation process. Competition policy is a useful tool that has been discussed for virtual infrastructure, big techs, and so on and so forth, and can also be considered for new energy sources, and so on and so forth. Innovation has to be allowed to flow as an available public good that contributes to total factor productivity, benefiting all of us. Now third, policies to address climate change requires coordination between all actors in society and all countries. Again, there is no silver bullet. To tackle the complexity of global warming, no single country, no single agent can do it alone. At the BIS, we have been saying that addressing it, it calls for global and local coordination of policies. To move to a net zero carbon economy requires cooperation between various agencies in government, including the treasury, the private sector, and civil society. Central banking community is playing its part through the central banks and supervisors network for greening the financial system, the NGFS. The private sector has been very active too. For example, with the initiatives under Mark Carney, the new alliance called for the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. It brings together two existing finance alliances, Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative and the UN Convene Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. We have at the BIS co-organized a Green Swan Conference this year to promote coordination between the private financial sector and the central banking community. Fourth, a coordinated approach by many actors operates using several instruments. Their selection depends on mandates of actors and country specificities. Both price and quantity instruments should be part of the policy toolkit. Instruments include carbon tax, better disclosure of risks, improving taxonomy of green financial instruments, developing new technologies, fostering research, and so on and so forth. Institutions like the BIS are contributing in areas where we have expertise. Integrating climate risks into financial stability frameworks, developing taxonomy and standards, and also working on concrete banking products that help finance green projects, among other things. One example is the BIS Innovation Hub's first green finance project, Genesis. It will explore the tokenization of green bonds, enabling investments in small denominations, combined with real-time tracking of environmental outputs. Cooperation, again, needs also to be international. 
That is for two reasons. First, leakage is a major threat to decarbonizing the economy. For example, if a country has an ambitious carbon price trajectory, but does not apply this to its imports, it defeats the purpose. Second, the transition to net zero requires financial and technological resources that many developing countries do not have. Therefore, tackling climate change is a common and shared responsibility for all countries and citizens in the whole planet, and it will benefit everyone in the long run. Fifth, climate policies have distributional impacts and present difficult political economy challenges. The challenges of political economy of successful structural reforms are, we know, immense, as pointed out by Manker Olson and Elinor Ulstrom for managing common pools of resources. Climate is no different. And actually, to some extent, climate policy can be seen as the mother of all structural reforms. To be successful, it has to change relative prices to impact the composition of consumption, investment, and public spending altogether in the global economy and within a very tight time frame, as pointed out by Jean Pisani Ferry. How to design the right involvement and possibly a consensus? Which institutions and narratives can create checks and balances to demonstrate the static and intertemporal welfare gains of the set of policies against global warming? Chances are that policies would have to include lump sum transfers to bring citizens tangible proofs of the benefits of such policies. Possibly the nature of uh, political cycles would lead to some procrastination, but it is not an excuse for those actors that can move to wait and see. Indeed, analytical challenges remain. For example, improving our macroeconomic uh, tools and models specific for climate change, like the integrated assessment models developed by uh, William Nordhaus. If the transition does not necessarily converge to a nice equilibrium, can it at, le at least somehow show us a positive growth path, perhaps using more forceful public policies and investment, as advocated by Nick Stern and Joe Stiglitz. Finally, and sixth, financing the transition to net zero could become a Schumpeterian creative destruction process. It could be a illustration of the growth model of, for example, Philippe Agion. Uh, using private-public cooperation to mitigate uh, climate risks uh, can produce better odds of making the post-COVID recovery more sustainable and more inclusive. It may also contribute to smooth the innovative process of moving towards a net zero carbon economy through massive investments in new technologies and in alternative energies. Private investment funds, making resources available to developed and developing nations, can complement efforts by multilateral, regional, national development banks. Both have an important role to play in the transition, as well as the whole private financial sector. Remember, during the Industrial Revolution in the 18th, 19th century, the private financial sector financed the evolution from agrarian to industrial societies. Given the huge financing needs of the transition to net zero, it has an important role to play in the transition to a low-carbon economy, working with the right combination of policies and with the public sector. Climate change is an urgent and critical issue. It needs coordination, determination, cooperation, and consensus building. Consensus is needed because fighting climate change is the mother of structural reforms. And we know from experience that reforms always have significant redistributive consequences. The coming COP26 in Glasgow is an opportunity to reaffirm commitments, mobilize resources, work on these challenges, propose and implement practical solutions. Thank you.